Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the eo for im NASA RSET webinar. Um, this is a harnessing Earth observations to support Indigenous-led land management. My name is Karen Tabor. I'm the Director of Early Warning Systems in the Betty and Gordon Moore Center for Science at Conservation International, and I'm joined here by my colleague, David Hunt. Hi. I'm David Hunt, and I'm the Spatial Coordinator for the Betty and Gordon Moore Center for Science at Conservation International. So first I wanted to introduce the eo for im project. Um, this project is funded by NASA Applied Scientists A.50 Geo Work Program, and is part of the AmeriGeos initiative. The aim of this project is to strengthen the technical capacity of indigenous peoples organizations in the Americas for improved sustainable land management. We also aim to involve two new stakeholder groups to a Marigios initiative. These are indigenous groups and conservation organizations. So um, what are what is GEO and Amerigios? Well, GEO is the Group on Earth Observations. It's an intergovernmental organization and it works to um, prove the availability, accessibility, and use of Earth observation data in order to benefit society. AmeriGeos is an initiative under GEO and is a framework to help promote collaboration and coordination among the GEO members on the American continent. AmeriGeos aims to increase the regional capacity of data infrastructure and the use of Earth observation and tools and data platforms for sustainable development. And it's focused on four societal benefit areas. These are biodiversity and ecosystems, disaster resilience, food security and sustainable agriculture, and water resources management. Now that I've introduced the group of Earth observations, I want to take a step back and define what are Earth observations. Well, Earth observations are gathered information about the physical, chemical, and biological systems on Earth. Earth observation systems collect information, and they're collected from a variety of sources. These include satellites, ground sensors, ocean buoys, mobile phones, um, any other way you can collect information to monitor changes on Earth. So now that I've explained GEO and AmeriGeos and Earth observations, I want to highlight how eo for im project is enhancing the capacity of Indigenous Peoples organizations to use Earth observations data for enhanced land management. Our novel approach is to combine remote sensing with social science. The project has two main components. First, a needs assessment with a selection of indigenous groups. The social science methods will help capture the group's land management goals, challenges, and technical capacities. The second component is capacity building. Based on the results of the needs assessment, we will design targeted training materials and conduct webinars, including this one, and on-site trainings to improve land management utilizing earth observation data, products, and tools. So before beginning this webinar, I would like to first introduce you to NASA's RSET program. RSET provides training in three different formats, online, such as this webinar, in person, and online and in person, train the trainers workshops. These are aimed to promote remote sensing capacity building through other programs and institutions. Since 2008, RSET has conducted more than 110 trainings to more than 18,000 participants from 160 countries around the world. The popularity of RSET webinars has expanded internationally over the past decade. To learn more about RSET, you can go to the website or and also sign up for the listserv to get emails about upcoming training. This EOFRI IM webinar aims to provide an overview of remote sensing concepts, satellite sensors, and image interpretation relevant to sustainable land management. To highlight the range of remote sensing applications available to inform sustainable land management decisions, and to enhance participants' knowledge with practical, implementable techniques and tools to improve land management decisions. 
The format of this course um, are three sessions. The first session is an introduction to maps and GIS, and that's today, and it's a 90-minute session. The second session is introduction to remote sensing. This will be February 12th. This is an hour-long session. The third session is applications for sustainable land management focused on early warning and alert systems. This will be February 19th, also an hour-long session. Each session has um, English and Spanish presentations. The English presentations in the morning of the, the day of the session and the Spanish sessions in the afternoon. There's also a certificate available for participating in this course. To receive a certificate, you need to attend all three sessions and complete and return two homework assignments. Assignment number one will be given at the end of today's session and will be due prior to tomorrow's uh, session number two. Assignment number two will be given at the end of session number two and will be due prior to session number three. Today's session is an overview of mapping and GPS technologies, and we will also be giving case studies of participatory mapping and participatory GIS for mapping traditional ecological knowledge and cultural heritage. I'm now going to turn over to my colleague David Hunt to talk about the introduction to maps and GIS. All right, so after that introduction to RSET and EO4IM, let's get started. Uh, and we're going to begin with an introduction to maps. What is a map? Well, it's a graphical representation of reality. This map on the right is a representation of the reality on the left. But what about images like these, photographs and paintings? These are not maps. Unlike photos and paintings, maps portray relative position, size, and distances, often from an overhead view. As you can see in the map of the Galapagos on the right, position, size, and distance can easily be interpreted through this simple representation. So now that we know what a map is, what is normally displayed on a map? Maps will show us many different features depending on location displayed and the goal of the map. Features can be shown such as bodies of water, roads, cities, and elevations. Base maps can be placed under features like roads to provide context, context for where the road is and where it goes. Thematic maps can display themes such as vegetation cover, soil type, climate, and political boundaries. These features can be displayed in three different data types, points or dots, lines, and polygons. Small settlements or specific locations are often expressed as points on a map. Roads and rivers are often expressed as lines, and lakes or larger areas such as big cities or countries can be represented by a variety of shapes or polygons. Different colors can be used on maps to highlight features and make them clearly legible against a base map or other features on the map. These colors are often very similar to colors of these objects in the real world. For example, blue is often used to represent water, and green is often used to represent vegetation. Maps can also show elevation levels and changes, or relief. This can be done by using something called contour lines like the one seen on the bottom left. These lines show distinct elevation levels, so the same line on different parts of the map will show the same elevation. Lines close together will show steep terrain, and lines far apart will show flatter land. So where are these objects on a map? How do we orient ourselves to gain meaningful information? We use cardinal directions. These are often denoted by an arrow that points in the north direction. The standard map will have a north arrow pointing to the top of the page. This means that the south will be on the bottom, west will be on the left, and east will be on the right. 
In order to provide more precise information about location and relative position on a map, we need to use more than just cardinal directions. To do this, we use something called coordinate systems. Coordinate systems are a grid of horizontal and vertical lines that divide a map based on its global position. The horizontal lines are called latitude lines and the vertical lines are called longitude lines. Latitude ranges from a value of zero at the equator to 90 or 90 degrees north at the North Pole and negative 90 or 90 degrees south at the South Pole. Longitude ranges from zero at the established prime meridian that runs through England to 180 degrees east and 180 degrees west in the Pacific Ocean. This allows any point on the planet to be defined by two unique numbers. Now let's take a step back and think about how a globe can be divided and represented on a map. The circular map on the previous page would not be that useful for looking at the whole globe because it only showed one side of the planet. The Earth and therefore globes are three-dimensional while a map displayed on paper or a computer screen is two-dimensional. This means that the three-dimensional globe must be projected onto a two-dimensional surface. An example of this process can be seen in this video. When this is performed, we get the transformation seen in the maps below. Now that the map is shown on a two-dimensional surface, latitude and longitude can be replaced by x values for longitude and y values for latitude. These values now represent meters from the axes. These values may look very familiar to you if you used a GPS device before. So now that we have discussed coordinate systems and how to identify precise positions on a map, we can discuss GPS or global positioning system. GPS is a satellite-based navigation system that provides global position at a given time. When many satellites orbit the planet in the manner shown in this video, GPS can provide this information for any location on the Earth. This video shows the satellites orbiting simultaneously to show that there is a large constellation orbiting at any given time. To accurately measure location, your GPS, GPS device or phone interacts with the satellites. As seen in this video, interaction with only one satellite is only enough to determine which side of the planet you're on. Therefore, more satellites are needed to provide more precise information. Interaction with two satellites shows only two points where the users can be. But this is still not good enough. A third satellite needs to be used to fully triangulate the signal to your exact location. And a fourth satellite can be used to provide additional validation. This system works around the globe all day and at a very high precision. There are issues, however. The atmosphere can cause errors and distort the signal, and a tree canopy can get in the way of the signal as well. The signal needs a clear path to the satellites. Dense materials such as metals and rocks will obstruct the signal, but light, light roofing is often fine. GPS devices can store three different data types. Waypoints, or points that you've been. Tracks, or the paths that you have taken. And routes, which are the shortest lines between two points you have visited. As you can see, tracks on the right, and then the routes. In order to fully understand the power of maps, no discussion would be complete without GIS or geographic information systems. GIS is a framework for managing, analyzing, and displaying spatial data. GIS can map and analyze relationships of objects through space and time. 
This can be done by adding multiple layers to the same system, as the image to the right shows. The ability to view many layers in the same area allows the user to effectively capture a variety of information, including data, photos, videos, and recorded stories. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Karen to discuss participatory mapping and participatory GIS. Hi, right, thank you, David. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about participatory mapping and participatory GIS. Um, first, I'll define uh, both of those terms. Participatory mapping is also known as community-based mapping. It includes techniques that combine mapping tools with participatory methods, often um, engaging communities or groups of people. And the goal is to represent local knowledge and perspectives in a map. Participatory GIS, or PGIS, is actually a way of managing spatial information that can include several different approaches to spatial planning and different perspectives and different knowledge systems. The aim of it is to be able to store a diversity of viewpoints in order to improve spatial planning and bridge the gap between different knowledge systems. The applications of PJS and participatory mapping are to map territories, record cultural heritage, biodiversity monitoring with um, and biodiversity monitoring with traditional ecological knowledge, also referred to as TEK. So next, I'm going to go through a few examples of participatory mapping and participatory GIS. The first example is participatory mapping in the native community of Alto Mayo, the San Martin region in Peru. This native community in Alto Mayo, there's 14 Awakun communities in the Alto Mayo area in San Martin region in Peru. Um, there's about 414 people, including 89 families. And the community lives um, on Loved almost 11,000 hectares of land. Some of the challenges with the community um, are renting land to migrants. There's a forest cover loss. About 50% of forest has already been lost. And land use change from forest and agricultural land, conversion to coffee, rice, and cacao. In this project, we use participatory map mapping to promote the interest of learning about the land to give, help give access to tools such as map in, maps and images, and the mapping help contribute to proper use of natural resources. So here are some pictures of the participatory mapping, uh, included adults and children, men and women, about 41 people, um, with four communities, with settlements within the community. And the first activity was to survey resources in the community. The community reviewed maps that were of imagery from drones, and they created a legend of, of uh, areas that they of interest, of land cover, of um, different points of interest for the community, and drew that on the, on the paper map. Here's the map of the drone imagery that they use to draw places of interest and land cover types. And here's some pictures of the community discussing the different types of land use, land cover, drawing rivers, and delineating different types of ecosystems. The visual delineation of land cover drawn over the drone imagery was used to produce this land use map of the Alto Mayo. Members of the community helped to validate the types of land use by confirming the land use type on the ground using handheld GPS devices. The final map product produced by the community was a map of natural resource use. The map helps the Awahoon community identify the areas where they extract and use their natural resources. For example, hunting areas, places of medicinal plants, extraction of wood, and crops. 
participatory mapping helps promote knowledge of the territory. It contributes to the land zoning process for improved land management, and it serves as an important input for the implementation of the community's life plan. It also provided a baseline for a monitoring and patrol system for communal land. The next case study is the Mahuna Kichwa Regional Conservation Area, and it's an example of participatory GIS or PGIS. Mahuna are one of Peru's most vulnerable ethnic groups. They have less than 500 people. The Mahuna live in four communities. These communities have been granted legal title to their land, but it's only a small portion of their ancestral territory. The Mahuna people remain connected to their land despite of the lack of recognized rights to their original territory. So some of the challenges that the Mahuna face are the decisions of land tenure and land use are often made by government actors and they require spatial information to inform land management and land management policies. Indigenous territories are often inadequately mapped because historically government favored Western scientific knowledge over indigenous knowledge and social practices. So culturally and biologically important ecosystems were not fully represented in the spatial planning process. The consequences of this are logging and illegal poaching that threaten the land, which remains outside of their direct legal control. There's a loss of cultural heritage. And in 2008, the Peruvian government planned to construct a 130 kilometer road and a development corridor directly through the, their ancestral territory. So the participatory GIS solution to these challenges was to improve mapping and environmental management of the indigenous territory. They wanted to capture diverse ecological and cultural knowledge required for better spatial planning. The PGIS can inform land tenure and land use to, de to design and preserve culturally and biologically important ecosystems. So the Mayajuna take action. They create an indigenous federation, and this was the first attempt to gain better control over their ancestral lands and preserve their environmental and cultural heritage. Next, they invited PGS researchers to document the important historical connection that the Mayahuna have with the land around them and map their territory. The PGS process took over five years. From 2004 to 2009, they conducted four participatory mapping sessions and did PGS field work. The participatory mapping was included a hand-drawn map seen here. First, they drew the river, and the communities drew um, places of important biological and cultural significance. In the end, after the four different sessions, they mapped 900 sites of biological and cultural importance across four communities. Next is the participatory GIS. A team of researchers and community volunteers took these hand-drawn maps and also took handheld GPS um, units and, and went to the field and mapped the spatial coordinates for each of those 900 points on the hand-drawn map. They also used digital cameras and took photographs of the sites. This is how they catalog traditional ecological knowledge also essential for biologists and conservationists working in the area. This, in the addition to the cultural mapping, this biological inventory revealed that the area had previously unclassified and unreported habitat with new, rare, and specialized species. This mapped cultural and biological information helped inform the design of a new conservation area that connected the four Mayahuna communities. In 2015, the government of Peru approved the establishment of almost 400,000 hectare area de conservation regional Mahuna Quichua, also known as the ACR. This new area prevented the road development through the Mahuna's ancestral land. 
The ACR also protects the ancestral land from increased pressures from loggers and poachers. So in conclusion, um, governments need spatial data informed policies and participatory GIS and participatory mapping are, can be effective tools to record cultural and traditional ecological knowledge. PGIS can help increase indigenous representation in policy decisions. And so this picture here um, is just a news article about the, um, the new reserve that was approved. It made a lot of headlines because it was an extremely large area and a very and biologically diverse and culturally important site. The next case study is a spatial planning study in the Canolas Quichua community in Ecuador of their life plan update. The territory of Quichua community of Canolas is located in the Ecuadorian Amazon in the province of Pastaza. It covers 18,000 hectares and is home to more than 1,700 inhabitants. Despite being an ancestral indigenous community, it experienced high urban influence due to its proximity to the town of Puyo and faces problems associated with cultural loss, poverty, deforestation, biodiversity loss, and inefficient production practices. They just began a process to update their life plan, which is a territory management plan. And this process includes strong local engagement and with support from the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International, and the Moore Foundation. This local engagement include um, diagnosis, diagnosis workshops where a 12-person delegation made up from local team, technician team of socioeconomic promoters, park rangers, and natural resource managers were engaged in training of GPS use, mapping, data collection, and surveillance. Over 87% of the territory is covered by native forests. Therefore, it's necessary to establish specific land zoning and define regulations for use and coexistence. Some information considered for the analysis were vegetation cover on land use, dynamics of land use change, land use conflicts, which are current use versus potential or optimal use. Some of these maps are shown here on the right. The community has a socio Bosque conservation agreement that covers 71% of the territory. For those not familiar with the conservation incentives program, socio Bosque, socio Bosque is a national program that establishes an agreement between owners of natural lands and the government. The landowners conserve their forests and the government gives them economic incentives. The amount of money depends on the conserved area and the type of ecosystem. The incentive comes from the national budget and it is given to the landowners twice a year and the agreement lasts 20 years. Landowners could be individuals or communities. The beneficiaries of the incentive must present each year a plan of investment for their incentive. The Canolas Quichua need to use the 600 hectares to give lands to some families. The population has increased, so they need lands to support homes and productive lands. Their main productive activities are grasslands for cattle grazing, and they also grow cacao, banana, and cassava. Currently, the local technical team is surveying the land use potential within the territory. Following the surveys, they will generate a report to negotiate an amendment to their socio Bosque agreement. This land use planning process highlights the value of capacity building in participatory mapping and spatial concepts to help communities produce maps and reports that can enhance negotiations of land use planning policies and conservation agreements. Next, I'm going to show you a demonstration of mapping cultural heritage with Google Earth. You can find a video about this online at YouTube. We're going to play the video now. It's about 11 minutes long.
Meu nome é Almi Suruí, eu sou líder do povo Paité Suruí que vive na Amazônia, no estado de Rondônia, no Brasil. Antes do primeiro contato com o mundo exterior, nosso povo vivia da floresta e dos seus abundantes recursos. Apenas 43 anos, em 1969, a floresta dos Paité Suruí foram abertas para a construção de rodovia BR-364. Ao redor do nosso território, a floresta foi desaparecendo de forma rápida e os madeireiros ilegais foram invadindo os limites de nossas terras. Nosso povo percebeu que não sobreviveriam sem a floresta e que alguma coisa precisava ser feita. Por isso, em 1992, o meu povo me elegeu como um dos líderes do Paité Suruí para ajudar e discutir e elaborar o plano de 50 anos para o futuro do nosso povo. Conheci o Google quando acessei a internet pela primeira vez e logo tive a ideia de me encontrar com eles e ver de que forma poderemos trabalhar em conjunto. Viajei para a Califórnia e de lá encontrei Rebecca Moore, fundadora do Google, e começamos a planejar uma parceria de longo prazo entre tecnologia moderna e o conhecimento tradicional do povo Paité. Hoje os Paité Suruí estão trabalhando para monitorar suas florestas, combinando a tecnologia e seu conhecimento tradicional. Usando o Google, nós agora podemos compartilhar a nossa visão com o resto do mundo. Em 2006, nós criamos um mapa do nosso território e de nossa história tradicional. Mas algumas pessoas nunca haviam tido a oportunidade de ver este mapa em pessoa. Para alcançarmos o mundo, nós treinamos os adolescentes Paité Suruí em maio deste ano, eles trabalharam em conjunto com o Google para criar a mapa cultural do Suruí no Google e mostrar a visão Paité Suruí de suas florestas. Agora, os adolescentes Paité Suruí vão compartilhar alguns dos destaques deste mapa cultural em 3D. Meu nome é Valela Pilima, sou da aldeia Lapetanha. Ocorreu um conflito entre o povo Paité e Suruí com os invasores que estavam ocupando o território de Suruí, o qual nesta época eram os colonos. Esse fato se tornou importante porque acelerou o governo a demarcar a área e logo depois que o território de Suruí foi demarcado, foi o fim do conflito entre os povos. E neste mesmo local foram realizadas algumas festas culturais importantes para os ruídos. Um exemplo é o Mapa Maí. E pelo ponto de vista do povo Paité, essa guerra foi necessária porque por trás disso teve o interesse do povo Suí para demarcar a sua área, que hoje possui 248 mil hectares. Meu nome é Luan, o Pinho Hortemo Suruí, sou tribo Suruí. A aldeia da Petanha foi fundada foi fundado no ano de 1931, quando o cacique Itabira né, estava andando, andando no mato, ele viu os homens brancos estavam invadidos o seu território no ano de 1982. O Itabira veio junto com a sua família para morar, para morar faz a fazenda sua barraca, uma maloca. Para ficar a morar antes disso, ele mandou a FUNAI expulsar o homem branco que estava invadindo a terra. No ano de 1983, a família de Tabira já mandaram junto com ele, junto com ele fazer a sua casa, um homem, 
o nome do capitão foi dado a nova aldeia, porque um dos brancos que moravam no local tinha o seu horto torto. Em Pimodé, Lapetain, é por isso que os índios chamaram de naquele local Lapetain, atualmente conhecido como Lapetain. Oi, Tchepo, professor. Eu fiz sobre a pintura, eu vim falar que a pintura é muito importante para o povo Paité. Porque ela está incluída em tudo que o povo faz, principalmente nas festas, nos rituais e as outras coisas também. A pintura, peraí, a pintura é uma das coisas mais valorizadas pelo povo. Meu nome é Ubiratã, meu nome é Tabá, Suruí. É, os Paitéis Suruí gostam de, de caçar em, em grupos. E porque quando a caçada é grande, tem mais caçada, são divididos em toda a aldeia, para toda a família. E, e há dois tipos de caçada. É a caçada de um dia e a caçada de, de três ou mais dias. A caçada de um dia é, é apenas um dia. O, os índios saem da aldeia para caçar de manhã e só voltam quando mataram algum bicho. É, e assim, a caçada de três ou mais dias são planejadas antes, porque o pessoal tem que... É, planejar onde vai ficar, é, os bons lugares da caça, de pesca, e, e assim ficam um, três ou uma semana por aí. E as caças que eles caçam são divididos em toda a aldeia, para toda a família, e, e as pescas também. Os, o, as caças mais preferidas são porcão, mebê, é, Marraicor, macaco barrigudo e é, mutum, que é, a, a, que é a ave do mato. E outras caças não são tão procuradas pois, devido à cultura, porque tem certos, certos bichos que, que nem, nem todo o pessoal pode comer, só os adultos e não as crianças. Meu nome é Estevo, pagou a carne de Ceruí. As folhas de açaizeira servem para forrar as malocas, Ceruí, para balaias, para caça e uma barraquinha para caçar aves. É uma fruta muito saborosa, muito e nos tempos antigos, o povo Paité Suruí, eles utilizaram mudas de açaí para, para se comunicar com os espíritos e se para preparados para as batalhas. Hoje o Suruí ainda fala das propriedades espirituais do açaí. Sem a floresta, toda a nossa cultura desapareceria. Sem a nossa cultura, a floresta teria desaparecido há muito tempo.
é importante viver de forma sustentável e fortalecer aqueles cuja subsistência depende diretamente de um ecossistema saudável. Nós temos um plano de sustentabilidade de 50 anos, que inclui soluções para nosso território. Um exemplo é o projeto Carbono Suruí, que usa a tecnologia para monitorar o estoque de carbono da floresta e negociar no mercado de crédito de carbono. A nossa esperança é que possamos nos unir virtualmente e em pessoa, em que possamos nos encontrar e implementar soluções em conjunto. So next we're going to show you how you can view this cultural map in Google Earth. You will need to install the Chrome web browser and then launch Google Earth at this web address. There we go. Next I will show you how you can import the KML file that displays the cultural map. Once you have Go Earth installed in your Chrome browser, you can import a KML, but first you have to enable the KML import in your settings. And you can go to My Places to view the cultural map. I'm going to show you that right now. Here is the Google Earth interface in the Chrome browser. You go to Settings and go to the bottom of the settings. You need to turn on this toggle. The default is off, so this is an important step if you want to upload a KML file. Save that. And now you can go to My Places. Here, you can import your KML file from a file or from a Google Drive. I had already downloaded the KML to my computer, and I opened up the file in Google Earth. This icon can turn the layer on and off. You can double click, and this will take you directly to the cultural map. This is the map you saw in the YouTube video. Here, you can interact with the map yourself. This show, these icons show different, the, the warrior shows different battles and where they took place. The macaws indicate biodiversity in places of biological significance. You can zoom in and show locations of, of jaguars where they have spiritual importance to the community. Some of the trees indicate plants that are important to the community, both culturally and also nutritionally. Some of these bushes represent also plants of medicinal purposes, and these buildings signify where there may be buildings of cultural importance, such as this building, which is Assembly Hall. You can also look at this map in three dimensions. To 
go back to two dimensions, just click this link. Now you can also download this data and look at this map, and you can even create a map of your own that's similar to this map. After this session, we will go through a homework assignment that will introduce you a little bit more to Google Earth, and so you will be able to do a, make a similar map. But first, I want to summarize just what we've learned in session one. We discussed maps, introduction to GPS, um, we introduced participatory mapping, participatory GIS, and provided several examples of applications of participatory mapping and participatory GIS. We also showed um, a demonstration of cultural mapping in Google Earth. Next, I am going to pass it back to David to introduce session two and the homework. And lastly, homework assignment number one. You can complete one of two homework assignments by next week's session for participation credit. These assignments will help you learn how to use Google Online Mapping Services. The first option uses Google Earth Pro. This service has many useful features, but you do need to download and install it onto your computer. So if you don't have this capability, then you can choose the second option, which uses Google My Maps. This can be done directly on your web browser and is a bit easier to use. This assignment can be found in the handout section and the materials webpage for the webinar. All of the instructions for completing the assignment can be found in the homework document. Please complete this homework by the beginning of next week's webinar session. And thanks everyone for listening to our first session of our eo for im webinar. In next week's session, we are going to provide an overview and a history of remote sensing, and then we will provide an introduction to current remote sensing technologies for land management, including drone remote sensing and available resources. Now I'm going to turn over to the floor for any questions. Hello, everyone. Um, I have been seeing some questions come into the chat. Uh, so thank you for the excellent questions. Um, I'm going to go through them. I'll read out the questions and then answer them. Um, so first question, are active projects which are using remote sensing to monitor canopy disturbances and reporting on them at a regular interval in, to indigenous communities are, are, sorry, are there active projects so they can use the data to ground truth and verify illegal forest use and violations of reserves and et cetera? So the answer to that is yes. We did present an example particularly of um, in the Alto Mayo. And also we are aware of other examples in Brazil and people working on projects in Brazil, working with indigenous communities, utilizing um, deforestation, like forest disturbance monitoring to help with uh, enforcement um, to protect the forest from legal activities. And um, we would love to hear from our participants. If you are working on projects like these, uh, please share your stories. Um, we're always interested in hearing how you're applying remote sensing data. Um, the next question is, will this training have an application for American Indian data in North America? Um, as you notice, the focus of this webinar is very much South America, but the data methods um, can be applied anywhere um, in the world. So number three, a question. What is the difference between geographic information systems and geographic information science? Well, um, geographic information systems is a method to collect, store, and organize and analyze geographic data. Geographic information science is the research um, behind the application of geographic information systems. So GIS, uh, geographic information science researchers are really interested in the research questions of how GIS um, influences individuals and society. And there are many schools of thought on uh, GIS science. Um, 
they kind of follow the schools of thought along scientific epistemologies. So um, these include realism and critical GIS. Um, part of critical GIS is uh, a feminist GIS, and it's more about um, democratizing GIS tools and and really representing the previously marginalized or underrepresented in GIS um, science. So question number four is, what is a life plan? It's a good question. Um, a life plan um, is a development plan for a community. Um, sometimes community, they set goals for development to ensure future growth while um, also sustaining future generations spiritually, culturally, and also with enough um, ample natural resources. Okay. Another question that came in. Is anyone doing participatory mapping with open source tools such as QGIS? Um, though I don't have specific examples, um, but QGIS is definitely a tool um, that can be used for uh, participatory mapping because it's a geographic information system that can store and manage GPS coordinates, collect data, create maps, and CI does use QGIS. And um, in general, in this webinar series, we are presenting open source uh, tools and methods. Um, so everything that you will learn about here, um, for the most part, is open source. So another question um, that came in, how is traditional ecological knowledge protected in the mapping process? Um, that's an excellent question, and that um, depends on the researcher and how the researcher engages the community. So um, obviously, there's a lot of privacy information with traditional ecological knowledge, and that conversation has to happen between the researcher and the indigenous communities to ensure that data won't be made public if it's not wanted to make public. Um, and many of these tools, even though they're open source and even in Google Earth, um, you can choose to make the information, the mapping information public or not. So um, that is something that is a high concern and needs to be addressed early on in the process. Okay, next um, question that came in, how to assure that the knowledge of these biological systems and resources is not abused? Indigenous communities have this knowledge for centuries. So who are they actually producing the maps for? So that's an excellent question. Um, and this is why, um, why we're really doing this webinar series is um, to help empower the communities with the tools and knowledge so they have control over the information and how they want to use it. Um, and as we had mentioned in one example, um, you know, policymakers and, and national governments, they do need geographic information to be able to do land management to delineate territories. So this information um, needs to come from the communities as well. but um, but it also, in the ideal situation is they have control to manage that information. Um, next question. In the video about the cultural map, I didn't understand the carbon credits trading in the market part that was mentioned in the video. Okay. Um, so in this particular uh, example, this group, uh, the uh, Suri people were um, their plan was to get carbon credits um, to establish a red uh, project site on their territory as a way to generate revenue um, for helping to reduce deforestation. So that was where that part of the, um, the, the video was referring to the, com the, the community's plan for generating revenue through red. All right, another question, um, do these communities have computer resources or support people with computer um, skills so they can instead use open source tools such as G QGIS? Um, it depends, it, it varies. Um, many uh, communities have representatives through uh, indigenous peoples or um, organizations and often at these levels of the organizations, um, there is access to computers and internet. And sometimes some of these organizations may have GIS technicians. So it really varies um, a lot. 
um, but the ideal is that somebody who is a representative of a digital community or protect or maybe even in the community can have access to these tools. Number 10, are these programs you are aware of, are there programs you are aware of that use Google Earth Engine database or um, data resources like Planet Research Credit? So, um, I, I mean, these are excellent resources. I know Planet's Research Credit is available for students, um, and perhaps you may know better if um, if uh, Indigenous communities can also apply for uh, Planet's Research Credit. That is to access free, very high resolution um, imagery from Planet. Um, but I'm not aware. I'm not particularly aware of that, and I could research that and, and get back to you on that one. Um, about Google Earth Engine database, um, I'm not aware of the communities or the organizations we're working with using Google Earth Engine, but we have CI uses Google Earth Engine. We're developing tools with the back end in Google Earth Engine. So, um, for instance, one of our tools that uh, that uses QJS, it's a plugin for QJS called Trends.Earth. Actually, the back end is Google Earth Engine, but you don't have to have an account for Google Earth Engine to use it. So, um, Conservation International um, and, and many other organizations are working in Google Earth Engine and developing tools that have a, um, a better interface so others can use it. Um, and I could also, in response to this webinar, send some more information about those organizations utilizing Google Earth Engine. Okay, um, question 11, do you think it's better to start with sketch maps on blank paper or to start with community drawing on top of a prepared base map, maybe already showing remotely sent land uses? Um, it's a good question and I, my answer is it depends. Um, if the community has already been exposed to mapping and, and cell information and is familiar with cartographic representations, um, then you can start with a satellite imagery um, to, to map some of the areas of interest. However, um, if the community has not seen very much satellite imagery or maps of their land, it is preferable to start with a blank map so that they can draw their own um, features in their representation of on their ground representation and spatial knowledge and relationships between the rivers and, and certain areas of interest, um, that is, is much preferable. All right, next question. How can traditional ecological knowledge and conservation be combined in cases where communities are losing their traditional ecological knowledge? Um, so this is, I think, where mapping resources can help preserve the traditional ecological knowledge. And also, I think that there's a lot of value to particularly monitoring with traditional ecological knowledge that um, needs to be emphasized more. For instance, um, say there's uh, drought conditions or, or high fire risk um, conditions, there may be traditional ecological knowledge of monitoring of certain plants that uh, when you see a certain plant wilt, that means that the drought conditions are at a certain level and there's really risk of high risk of fire spread. And we need to uh, kind of utilize, put more emphasis and, and more um, value on the different ways of monitoring. So integrating not just okay, satellite monitoring, but on the ground monitoring traditional knowledge and monitoring on the ground. And I think that uh, those integrated monitoring pieces will be much stronger together and we can have better information and forecasting systems about ecological conditions. Next question is, um, do cold call PGIS outreach efforts to indigenous communities tend to be successful or are most PGIS collaborations as a result of the indigenous community initiating the conversation with around PGIS? I 
think that obviously if the indigenous community um, initiates the conversation, then it's um, it's much more successful. Um, we, in general, when we're engaging indigenous communities, it's a long-term engagement, and um, it, which has been established over many years. So the examples we've shown where we are doing participatory mapping, um, we've been working with those communities for five, ten years um, prior to that. So it's uh, definitely preferable to have a very long-term engagement with the community and um, after the mapping as well. So it's not just do a map and then get out. Um, it, there needs to be this established connections. And so if you don't have, if you have previously worked with the community, ensure that you're partnering with groups who have long-term um, relationships with communities. All right, next question. Is that only one place where the program is running? You mentioned Sri. Um, so with, this is the Google Earth, um, talking about the Google Earth uh, cultural map. This is the, uh, I'm, I am not aware, I know that Google Earth is indeed engaging other indigenous communities, but I'm not sure where I could um, reach out to them and ask. Um, this is probably their highest profile um, engagement that was really successful, and it's the one that they have most of the materials um, on uh, on Google um, Earth. Next question. Have you ever recorded indigenous storytelling over time, not the single point in time, digitally on, into a map, and how did you represent the traditional ecological land use change? So this question is an excellent question. Um, I don't have experience with indigenous um, and recording indigenous storytelling. We do have um, on our EO4N project, we have an uh, anthropologist on the project, and we have um, our team in Ecuador and Peru who have a much more experience with digitally recording interviews and traditional ecological knowledge. So I could ask them and um, get back to you on this question. All right. Do property rights to maps and information um, rest with the communities or co-owned or what other ways? Um, this property rights to maps, this is a good question and it really should be, the property rights should be with the communities, and this is something that needs to be established when you are um, setting up your project, that who has the rights to the information and what are the privacy of the information. Um, if you haven't worked with indigenous communities before, um, or um, if you haven't done interviews or, or, or participatory mapping, there are a lot of research guidelines and uh, in engaging um, different groups and how to handle and manage data. Our team had to be certified in um, in research with uh, human research ethics, and that's something that if if you're working with communities, you're working with people at all in research, that you must get certified, and that will make you start thinking about what are the risks, how do I have to set up my project, um, how do I handle personal identifiable information, how, um, who owns the rights to information, all of those questions need to be thought through in advance. And there are a lot of research guidelines and certification processes available to help with that process. Next question. How do you deal with land and or social conflicts that can be triggered or aggravated by the mapping process? Um, that is a difficult question to answer. I think the, the best way is to try to avoid the, any aggregation. Like I mentioned, being prepared, um, knowing the risks going into the project, setting, establishing um, the rights of information, um, knowing who you're working with really well. Uh, I think all of that is in, in the preparation um, for when you're doing the mapping work. 
The case is quite a study of the drone is quite interesting. Um, they are two dimensional. There's three dimensional PJS use in your project area. What is your opinion on three dimensional PJS? So I'm assuming with P three dimensional that we're talking about monitoring over time, or um, are we talking about three dimensional like? Um, like lighter or like a height of canopy and stuff like that. Um, I guess if the person who wrote that can ask, can specify if uh, this is 3D in like space and time or 3D um, as far as like three-dimensional mapping and, and canopy structure and things like that. Either way, we we are <laughs> we don't or we haven't yet used lidar for. 3D mapping because the sensors for LiDAR are really expensive for um, drones and really heavy. The map with the carbon credit, what are the basic dates did you use to produce that map and what tools or software? So there's this uh, question here, the carbon credit, are we talking about the Surrey map in, in, um, in Brazil? That was all done with Google um, Outreach, and I'm not sure of the, the software that they use to produce, um, produce those maps, besides what we showed with, that you can do some of the mapping in Google, Google Earth or My Maps. Is it possible to make time-lapse cultural maps that reflect seasonal patterns and associated knowledge over time? I think there are definitely ways to create some of these maps that are show seasonality or seasonal patterns and changes over time. Um, I think this is a, a good question and it may mean a more dynamic map or a way of representing that seasonality or time or trends in the map. Um, there's also interesting ways to show information instead of just a map. For instance, you could, if you're familiar with like story maps, with like Esri has a story map platform that allows you to interact with a map um, show a tell a story and uh, talk about elements in the map and so there are different ways instead of, of, of um, communicating their information instead of just a static map have you ever looked at how open data I, um, lidar set data sets and indigenous data sovereignty can work together or are they completely contradictory So open data such as LIDAR, um, I'm not familiar with the example in Canada, um, mostly because CI works in the tropics, <laughs> but um, in general, we don't have open data sets like LIDAR data sets. LIDAR is extremely expensive. There are, um, there's now LIDAR on the International Space Station from the JEDI mission, and I think that could be interesting um, data set to for us to take advantage of, especially in the tropics. Um, but I, I can't comment on this particular with the indigenous data sovereignty and the LIDAR. Are ritual practices also recorded as part of participatory mapping? Um, I think uh, yes, I, if, if that's something of interest to the researcher or to the community, and it's definitely something that uh, can be recorded with mapping. What is the best platform to develop a simple interactive map that we can share for our participatory mapping? So I think the, the easiest platform is the platform we're working on for the homework. So it's really easy to create an uh, interactive map and um, if you want to share it and you can publish it, just make it publicly available. 
um, I definitely think Google Earth or My Maps is the the easiest to use. Can drones be used province-wide? Let's say 100,000 hectares in area. Um, that's a pretty large area for drone coverage. Um, I uh, I can ask our expert in. Peru, his thoughts on, um, he, he's the one that's most familiar with using drones uh, for the, especially in the Alto Mayo Reserve. It all depends on the drone, really. Um, you can get a very expensive drone that can cover a much larger area, um, but if you don't have a lot of money and you have a cheaper drone, it just can't go as far. So there's definitely, um, I think, a cost, uh, a cost um, element in that. But 100,000 100, hectares is, is pretty large for a drone. I just wanted to add really quickly that next session we do uh, talk a bit about drone mapping. Um, and we provide one example where we use acoustic sensors to target the locations that we deploy drones. So if you have a large range, you can uh, do something like that as well. Thanks, David. Um, does it ever create issues when indigenous people map their territories and resources and the governments try to suppress that information? And how do you manage that situation? So I know that there's definitely historical issues um, and you know possibly continuing issues. Um, that's more of um, We we actually don't tend to manage that situation because well our project particularly is is focused on the tools and technology. Um, we are we have a partner with the dedicated grant mechanism for Indigenous peoples, and um, that is a World Bank funded program, which is a knowledge sharing platform for Indigenous peoples represent um, represent representatives globally. And the whole purpose of that platform is more about the policy, the legal issues um, with, um, you know, with indigenous rights. And so that is more of the platform where the indigenous um, representatives themselves try to address issues of my information is not being, um, or, or, you know, where we're trying to get rights to our lands and then how can we, uh, how can we do this and what are the mechanisms to do this and how can we get funding for this and what are our legal rights so um, there are other platforms for for that sort of um, for those sort of issues with between the governments and the uh, organization do you find that starting with a blank sketch map maybe elicits more interesting things about the community's mental maps versus sharing them with land use map remote sensing imagery. Um, I definitely do think that the blank maps allows for more freedom um, and can, can bring out more information, uh, especially information about relational knowledge and different, and, and all, a different knowledge system can be captured on a blank map versus constrained to a already um, cartographic map of a satellite data. Can you please name some software that can be used for land use classification other than NV? Is ERDAS a good one? Um, ERDAS is an excellent software for land use classification. Um, it is proprietary, so, um, so it's an expensive software. There's also, I mean, you can do land cover mapping in um, QJS. You also, R is a fantastic open source software for land cover mapping. Um, so that's a, another resource. David, did you have any others that you're aware of? Um, yeah, we definitely go into this a little more in the next session. Um, I guess. The other one that I can think of is uh, SNAP. It's the European Space Agency's open source software. Mm -hmm. um, you can do a bit of analysis with that as well. Uh, it's 
Yeah, I, I guess Snap and QGIS would be some of the best options for, for free software to use. There's also Class Light as well that I know is, is popular, especially in um, applications in South America. We can put together a list and, and um, share that with everybody for next week. Um, next question, how can I calculate the forest canopy layer by using remote sensing? So um, remote sensing, there's different ways to get a forest canopy. Of course, the easiest way is extent of the canopy. Um, remote sensing can be used to estimate biomass of the forest ca um, canopy. But if you're looking at uh, structure and density, that's where we really need LIDAR remote sensing. And um, as I mentioned, LIDAR is usually something that's an airborne platform on a plane or a very large, expensive drone. Um, but also, um, just recently with the JEDI mission on the International Space Station, we will be getting LIDAR measurements from space, and that will be free. Um, next question is, can you please suggest the best remote sensing index to map urban sprawl of a region? So that's a question. There's a, a couple indexes to use. I am not so familiar with mapping urban areas. Um, of course, the easiest, quickest one would be using NDVI um, index. But there are many, many indices out there. Um, and in the next session, we're going to do a demonstration using um, an online, uh, Esri has a platform online that you can actually view and classify and, and do some uh, indices for remote sensing indices. And they have a bunch of predetermined indices, including an urban index. So I think, you know, next session, you can kind of play around with a bunch of different types of indices to see which ones are capturing urban sprawl. Um, there's also in, uh, we are, CI was developing a, a tool in Google Earth Engine that also kind of captures urban sprawl. I believe it's part of our Trends at Earth tool, but I'm not sure, it's still in development. So I, again, that's something else I can follow up um, next session about. Great. That was a lot of questions. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for the interest. And I don't see any more in the queue at this moment. Um, but you definitely kept me on my toes. Um, but any other questions, feel free to follow up with me and David. You have our emails. And also um, feel free to um, bring them up next week as well when we meet. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a fantastic first session and um, can't wait to meet again next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you.